Well, this is going to be so exciting as we come to God's Word. We need the precious Holy Spirit's help, so let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we believe we receive the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus, you have Holy Spirit on assignment to breathe on the Word of God. Make it find its mark in our heart. Give us revelation. Help us to be able to unfold this treasure map and get to the blessings and the treasures that you have ordained for us. In Jesus' name, we receive it. Amen. Born to Win Part 1. I am so excited about this series. This is going to be life-changing. I know it. I believe it for you. Look, we were born to win. We refuse to lose because we're born to win. And I know that reality, that Bible reality is going to get imprinted on your heart right now. In this part one, we're going to dial in on the real you. That's right. Born to win the real you. I'm so excited to jump into this new series. And here we go. Here's what I believe that God wants to do in your life as we jump into what I've experienced to be a life-changing truth for not only myself, but for many, many, many people people. God's going to use this message to give you an overcoming attitude, improve self-image, focus, focus, resolve, better health, and wins in life. And that's just to get you started for this year. It's just the beginning of this journey. In this part one, we're going to break into the code of the real you. This is absolutely essential to the subject of God's design of you being created to win, to overcome, to triumph. It's hard to believe this, but the topic of winning has actually become negative, even antagonistic in today's social, politically correct experiment. In a humanistic effort to level the playing field of life experience, think tank ideologues have decided that the only way to save an oppressed person is to balance that individual with an equal and opposite protagonist or enemy to their story. Basically, if you're losing, then it's every winner's fault. Well, that's foolishness. These academic idealists think they solve poverty, mental illness, and all the social unrest with their clinical theories. But no, you don't solve spiritual problems by lowering the moral and ethical standards so everyone gets a participation trophy. That's not how real life works. Human attempts to solve eternal problems only serve to prove again what the Bible says about intellect without, without wisdom. It's foolishness. And in God's eyes, arrogantly stupid. You were born to win and winning in God's plan for your life doesn't make you an oppressor, but rather a source of blessing and help for others. You're designed to be blessed to be a blessing, my friend. Have you ever noticed that the weak can't save the weak? Poverty can't save the poor. Untrained and uneducated individuals can't do successful brain surgeries. Tone-deaf people don't make great music. Blind people don't drive transport trucks and fly commercial airlines. Old people don't sign up for the military. And young people aren't the best experts on great life counsel. For some people, some lost souls who are trapped in a cloud of corrupt, subjective, amoral ethics, what I just said seems highly offensive to them. And yet their hypocrisy seems to know no bounds, as Doc Holliday once said in the movie Tombstone. These same people that buy into that narrow, binary life equation of oppressor and oppressed are also the same people that want their favorite team to win the championship. They want their stock picks to outperform the competition. They insist on lower prices from the plumber and the carpenter who work on their house, and yet they insist on higher wages for their job that they show up late for and do poorly. That's not God's plan for their life, and that, in great part, is why they live so miserably. They want to be rewarded for not fulfilling their God-given design. They want benefits for living outside God's plan. They are spiritual socialists. They want to be rewarded for their sense of victimhood. To the degree that they've been depressed, they want compensation. The problem is the Bible makes it clear when you reward foolishness, ignorance, you hasten the destruction of that person. Look at this in Proverbs 1 verse 32. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. 
What a serious warning. That's ancient wisdom from God's word. It's right now wisdom for life, but God's word predicts accurately that simple, foolish people will turn away from such direction. Instead, they'll believe the enemy of their soul that persuades them that not winning is winning. Being a victim is winning. Talking about the problem and complaining and blaming the other guy is somehow winning. It's the new theology of not winning is winning. Some new Christian types even want to make Jesus out to be a victim so they can sanction or sanctify the new religion of victimhood. And it all sounds so sacrificey and perfectly comfortable with a life of whining and woe is me living. Just take a listen to Jesus, the ultimate winner of all winners, as he talks about giving his life on the cross. Listen to this, John 10, starting at verse 17. Jesus said, I laid down my own life so that I may take it back. How's that for power? Then he goes, no one takes it away from me, but I lay it down voluntarily. I am authorized and have power to lay it down and to give it up. And I am authorized and have power to take it back. Excuse me, my friend, but that's 128% winner times a thousand. Jesus came to suffer and die for us to win. Yes, you heard me correctly, to win us back the blessing of God, the favor of God, the righteousness of God, and all the family benefits. Jesus is such a winner that we get to share in the rewards and the prizes that he deserves and has won at the cross. The cross is his extreme championship where he triumphed over the devil, the curse, the sin of humanity, and the kingdom of darkness. Now devils shake when they just even hear the name of Jesus. You see, this is the essential good news. This is the gospel of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to lower the bar and make all of our immorality and insanity somehow a new age of social justice. You know, lower the bar low enough and somehow make all of humanity able to be blessed. That would contradict the character of God. God loves you. He loves everyone, period. But that does not mean everyone gets the same life experience. That's not consistent with God's character or principle. God doesn't reward evil with blessing. God doesn't give a harvest of wheat regardless of what we sow. That's against his laws of life and order. That would be considered deceitful, corruption. God's not corrupt. He's true. He's righteous. He's just, he's perfect. He cannot lie. Your original design is in the image of God. You're made in God's likeness to be like him. That's right. You have a God design. And because of the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden, sin came in and became inherent to our condition as humans. We're all born in sin, which makes us spiritual losers, no matter how we perform, no matter how good we perform. Jesus' championship over the curse at the cross purchases our original design back for each one of us. You get to be the real you finally now. This is great news. This is winning news. This is why I say you are born to win. So often the question of identity is answered with job titles, positions, careers, even accomplishments. Some refer to their failures, their history, or their genetics. But none of this is the real, the true answer. This discovery is essential because your identity determines your destiny. Your identity determines your destiny. Who you are starts on the inside, in your heart, in your believer machine. That's what your heart is. Jesus says, a good tree produces good fruit. Well, that makes sense. An evil tree produces bad fruit. What you think and believe about you affects every part of your life. Even God, listen to this, even God cannot take you beyond the limit of your thinking. Your thinking decides your self-portrait. That's who you see yourself to be. Think of the way a computer works. If you write a document that has spelling errors, every time you print that same page, it will have spelling errors. You can't change the outcome unless you change the thinking of the computer, the programming of the document on the computer. How about this? As the computer thinks, it prints. 
as you think your outcome prints. You cannot, I repeat, you cannot exceed the programming of your heart. Look at Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a woman thinks in her heart, so is she. For God to use Abraham and make him a father of many nations, God had to change Abraham's self-portrait. He had to align the programming of Abraham and Sarah's heart. They're thinking with God's nothing is impossible thinking. And that's how this older couple ended up getting pregnant in their 90s. A mother and her daughter, they were sitting together having just a little mom-daughter time. The little girl said, Mom, when I grow up, can I be anything I want to be? The mom thought, this is a good teaching moment, she thought. You know, she said, honey, if you work hard, if you're a good girl, you do good at school, if you listen to mommy and daddy, well then you can be anything you want when you grow up. The little girl smiled big, closed her eyes in imagination. She goes, ah, oh, that's so good, mom, because when I grow up, I want to be a dolphin. That's funny and sad because in today's absurd scramble for identity, some parents would actually break with science and leave that on the table. Not good. The greatest ignorance of humanity, of mankind, is of himself. Everyone is born with a desire to be, to be someone, to even be something but you don't evolve into an identity by performance or wishing or by getting position, getting stuff, outdoing the next guy, knowing more than and doing more than. No, no, no. You choose your destiny by what or whom you choose to believe. Truth supersedes facts. Uniforms and jobs are facts. They're subject to change. Did you notice age? It changes. Popularity, it changes. Truth, on the other hand, never changes. And truth has the power to birth identity. So what is the truth about you? Well, well, I can just tell you quickly, first of all, you're born to win. God's word is truth. It's absolute. Knowing and believing the truth authorizes the truth in your life. Believing and thinking God's plan authorizes it in your existence. Truth over facts. Look at Jeremiah 29, verse 11. God says this about you. He says, for I know the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That's God talking to you. Now that's the truth of God's word about you, for you. But circumstances also talk, don't they? Those are the facts. The facts are subject to change, but God's truth is eternal, unchanging, empowered with life. All the pain and the failure that you've piled up in the backyard of your life, it talks. Your life experience is full of facts. But again, God's word is truth. And if you'll allow it, it will talk to you. But who are you listening to? The Bible asks the question, whom shall you believe? You see, your repetition determines your persuasion. What are you persuaded of? Is it your repetition set on facts or on God's truth? Jesus said, knowing the truth will set you free. But what about the facts? Oh, but you, you don't know my circumstances, Pastor Stephen. If you only knew the facts and the circumstances in my life, oh. Well, there's a gentleman named Kyle Menard. Kyle Menard was born a quadruple amputee. That means no legs, no arms. Those were the facts for that little baby boy. But with overcoming vision and truth, Cal grew up to overcome these challenges and become a champion wrestler, an award-winning mixed martial arts athlete. He can bench press 420 pounds. Look, I don't even know if I can bench press 120 pounds. He's a motivational speaker, an author, and is famously known for climbing Mount Kilimanjaro without the aid of prosthetics. Oh my goodness, when I look at him, I think, what? I don't have any excuses. Look, being born to win does not eliminate trouble, challenges, or temptations, but it does convert those things into opportunities. John 16, verse 33, Jesus said this. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world, 
you have tribulation and distress and suffering. He says, but be courageous. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world for us. Think of this, getting in a 747, you fly. You fly. You can go 550 miles an hour in a 747. Now, outside the plane, you're subject to gravity's power, aren't you? Your winning DNA does not eliminate trouble, challenges, or temptation, but it converts those things into opportunity for promotion. Are you in your God-given design or out living subject to the world's system of facts and gravitational power pulling you down lower and lower and lower? Understand this, your God design has a manufacturer's standard. Say that, manufacturer's standard. See, the maker of any product has a standard. You've gotta respect that. The manufacturer's standard ensures success and protects from failure, from abuses. Like everything in life, the maker of a thing decides the identity and purpose of that thing. Now, that doesn't mean that people still don't misuse a product and get some kind of outcome, right? Let's go back to the beginning of God's principle, God's design standard. I briefly touched on this before but it's in Genesis 1, starting at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. Now that word for man in the Hebrew is non-gender specific. He's talking about humanity here. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over all the earth and over everything on the earth. And then he goes on in verse 27, he says, so God created mankind, Remember, that's the word for the, the species of man in his own image. And then he says, male and female, he created the species of mankind. In the context of this truth, this revelation from God, think about this. The standard of the product is not set by the customer or the product itself, but by the manufacturer, right? Genesis 1.26 teaches us we are God's design, made in His image, His likeness, for basically one purpose, to have dominion, to have a purpose, to fulfill our design, to win. Notice it's image or character before purpose, identity before power. God didn't say, let some rule. He said, but let them rule. What? Not people, but the stuff. If you fail to understand the standard of your design, then you live a failed existence, a frustrated sense of purpose, often broken and subject to abuse. A chainsaw manufacturer actually had to advise their operational standard and say this, do not hold the wrong end of this tool. That's in the manufacturer's standard. If a certain car engine requires regular gas, then you better not put diesel fuel in the tank. Look, I'm not a car expert, but I know that. Or worse yet, don't put orange juice in the tank. If you neglect the manufacturer's standard, no matter how perfect the design is, you'll defeat the purpose of that thing. Some of you have felt utterly defeated, haven't you? Not long ago, Pam had this loaner from the dealership while her car was being worked on. It was this beautiful, brand new, beautiful Mercedes AMG. This thing was an amazing sports car. She was excited. And I had to go to a meeting, so I couldn't go out with her to run errands for a little bit of a ride. So after an hour, I come out of my office, and there's Pam pacing the floor, and I can tell she's very unhappy. She's frustrated. She said, that stupid car, it doesn't work. It's no good. Well, I knew there was more to the story because surely that wasn't a stupid car and I knew it did work. The guys just dropped it off. I went out to the car, had the key fob in my hand, and I had a slight idea of what the problem might be, <laughs> but I didn't tell Pam. So I sat in the seat and I knew a little bit about the manufacturer's standard of that car. So I sat in the seat, I put my foot on the brake, I pushed the button and all those powerful, all that powerful horsepower woke up and Pam was so impressed with me. And then of course I had to enjoy being the fix the problem guy for just a moment. And she was like, how did you do that? That's amazing. You see, the problem wasn't the car. It was not knowing the manufacturer's standard. Pammy didn't know, so Pammy didn't go. 
If you don't know, you don't go. And for a lot of you, that's been your reality. It's been frustrating. It's been discouraging. So discouraging. But that's all going to change. By God's word, that's all going to change. God engineered you. And God doesn't make junk. You're not junk. God engineered you. You're made in the image of God. And God is 100% winner. So you know what that makes you. That's your design. The question here is, do you know it? And if you don't know, you don't go. You are born to win, my friend. It's part of your DNA. What makes winning so important is that losing is so real. Children are orphaned. People are abused. Marriages fail. And when you visit the sick in the hospital room, ask them just how important winning is, how important overcoming is, beating this thing. Let me tell you a little bit of my own story. Like a lot of kids, I grew up with a single mom working hard to make ends meet and raising three children. It's not an exaggeration to say that we were quite poor. I remember waking up and being able to see my breath. It was freezing cold. We had no heat. We knew what it was like to live in basements, tiny apartments, low-rent places that we shared with a few big old rats. In the midst of all of that, mom taught us how to trust in God. We prayed for food. We prayed for rent, help, protection. And when we got robbed, we prayed and asked God to restore, and we saw it happen. Our dad struggled with addictions. Mom taught us to pray for him, to love him, and to believe for miracles. Even though we didn't see those answers growing up, we learned to keep believing and never let go of faith in God. Through all of that, I struggled to overcome the insecurities many children struggle with in a fatherless environment. I dealt with panic attacks. It started when I was five years old and all the way through my college years. I had medical issues that were never diagnosed as a child and I fought depression, severe depression. Mom told me later in life that she would often have people tell her that her son seemed so sad. Your little boy seemed so sad. But through it all, mom taught us kids to go to God's word, his promises, and believe for the impossible to reach for God's best. No matter how discouraged I felt or how much of a failure I thought I was, I'd keep coming back to the word of God and his powerful plans of destiny over me. And dare to believe faith in God would not allow me to permit my circumstances to dictate my future. When I felt rejected, forsaken, God would call me his son and speak to his great destiny for my life. Mom taught us to believe in God over our feelings and above the circumstances. And by the way, the prayers we prayed for our dad as little kids, prayers to come to Jesus and to know God's divine destiny, God answered those prayers. You see, I never was a forsaken fatherless kid. It may have looked that way, but God always, always wins. He always wins. Your history doesn't decide your destiny. You're not a rejected, forgotten child without a future. You're a child of Almighty God, and He personally watches over your future, your destiny. I don't live rejected. I'm accepted. I don't need to perform to be. I am what I am by the grace of God. The gravity of sin pulls us all down and demands, but grace supplies and lifts. Truth gives birth to identity. John 1 verse 12 says, But to as many as did receive Jesus, to them he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, trust in his name. Hey, I get what Jesus deserves. You do. When you believe on Jesus, you're born again. He rewrites your destiny. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. It's so hard living life outside the context of your true design. It's hard to be the right person in the wrong place. If you've had enough of trying to be someone on your own, trying to be good enough to be loved, to be liked, always feeling that you're on the outside looking in, these next few minutes are critical because it's all about your choice. God is true, unchanging, full of mercy with everlasting kindness toward us, but your power of decision either allows God access to your life or stops him. Nobody in the universe can delegate the authority God gave you on your behalf. Only you have that power. Only you can give your life to God. No one else can, not even God. 
The Creator said that your life, even in its most broken state, with all your pain, rejection, and failure, even in that state, God says your life is worth more than the whole world. Jesus asked, what would it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul? God has placed a supreme value on your life, so much so that He would give His only begotten Son for you. Your decisions always write your future, and right now, you have the power to make a decision to receive, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, writing not just the next 20 years, my friend, but your eternity. This isn't spiritual evolution. Jesus wants to give you an identity revolution, a fundamental transformation at the core of your being. No performance on earth can accomplish this quantum leap from slave to free, from illegitimate to legitimate, from lost to found. Only the perfect work of Jesus on the cross, raised up from death by power of the Holy Spirit, from cursed to blessed. Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect, sinless life, died on a cross to redeem us from the curse, being made a curse for us. For it is written in Galatians, Cursed is he who hangs on the tree. Why? That the blessing of God might come on you and me. You and me, the ones who don't deserve the blessing, but we get the blessing through Jesus. What blessing? The power and privilege of being called a child of God, a royal son, a royal daughter. Focus on this truth again for a moment. John 1, 12. To as many as receive Jesus, God has given the power, the right, and the privilege to be his children. Is that you? Are you living in the confidence of that power and privilege as a child of God? Are you living in the context of his amazing grace? Maybe you've called yourself a Christian for the last 20 years, but I'm talking about something way beyond church membership, family history, religious affiliation. I'm talking about a DNA transfer from Jesus that makes you a child of God, an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. I'm talking about an identity that graces, yes, entitles you to everything that belongs to Jesus. We get what Jesus deserves. How's that for amazing? I can lead you in a simple prayer. And because of your faith in God's truth, this prayer can be a miracle prayer that instantly transforms your heavenly status. Immediately, your name will be written and documented in heaven. That's what the Word of God says. You move from being under the power of the curse to being under the power of the good, good Father's blessing. If you want me to lead you in that miracle prayer, just whisper, that's me. Whisper it to God, that's me. Tell God you want everything Jesus paid for at the cross. Tell God you want the family name and the family status. Pray this simple prayer with me and just repeat it. Dear Lord Jesus, I've been outside long enough. You paid the price for my sin. You redeem me from the curse. Jesus, forgive me. I believe you died on the cross. I believe God raised you from the dead. Now I'm born again. A new creation in you. A new identity in you. No longer a slave to the curse. I'm a child of God. With family privileges, I'm adopted. I'm God's child. I've got royal family DNA. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.